On a planet called Origin, some plants have evolved in favor of movement and mental complexity similar to animals. In this video, I'll talk about how that happened, and then how some of them gained the power of flight. This is the planet, it's going through a bit of an ice age, but we're going to focus on some of the more temperate climates. The Atchadan is the west, the Orient is the east, and the Glacian is the north. At some point, I'm going to have to redraw the map to include that, but I'm too lazy at the moment. Plants are a group of eukaryotic organisms that are mostly classified by their ability to photosynthesize thanks to their derived mitochondria called chloroplasts. Origin classifies life by 12 magical elements, one of which is plant, but I won't really talk about magic in this video. If you're interested in that, I'm working on a big video that may or may not have come out by now which goes way in depth about it. As for the story of animal-like plants, it all started 200 million years ago, with a relationship between two plants. The one on the left is a plant-eating plant, and has incisor-like teeth to cut stems. They bend at nearby plants to eat their berries. The other, the watchtower plant, has a ring of whisker-like protrusions around the top that sense movement. When the watchtower plant senses a herbivore coming in to eat it, the watchtower plant pulls the stem out of danger. Both of these plants continued to evolve side by side in favor of more and more movement, and had dark colors to absorb as much energy as possible from the sun. Nowadays, there are two lineages of animal-like plants, one of heterotrophs and the other of autotrophs. These words just mean that one gets its energy mostly by eating other organisms, while the other makes its own food from photosynthesis. In this video, I'll talk a bit about both, focusing on one species for each. Let's start with the heterotrophs 100 million years ago. Once the plant-eating plant fully evolved out of the ground, it had a lizard-like form that rarely grew larger than 20 centimeters. By this time, they'd evolved simple eyes from the light-sensing organs of their ancestors, which greatly helped to find prey. They ate plants when times were tough, but had an insect-attracting structure on its head similar to a flower, meaning they likely preferred insects. This is because plants don't always have the proteins needed to maintain muscle, which these plants had some variation of. It's easier to get them from insects or other animals. Here's the final art. The palter plant was one of the earlier variations of animal-like plants. Its legs and belly were evolved from roots, while the rest of its body was a strangely swollen stem with leaves and other plant parts strewn about. Most animal-like plants have a concentration of chlorophyll on the top side of their body for extra energy. Later species we'll talk about have lost their photosynthesis almost entirely, but lots of others alive today still have it. Even other heterotrophs, meaning ambitroph might technically be a better descriptor. While this plant was kind of a blueprint for heterotrophic plants that came after, it doesn't show us how they evolve flight. While many of these plants evolved to be big and lumbering to save energy, one lineage actually evolved a quick metabolism to fill an empty niche. While they needed to eat almost constantly, food was plentiful and it gave them an advantage over other small animals to escape from predators. This was 50 million years ago, and these animals were the only ones in the area that could keep certain insect populations in check which they spend most of their time doing by sucking them up with its trunk. Most plants don't have a voice box, but these evolve them for simpler communication by squeaking. Here's the final art. Similar animals are alive today, which are pets called mouse plants. Get it? I love these little goobers. They, while they run on all fours, they're used to standing on two legs. Their compound eyes allow them to see more wavelengths of light than we can, mostly on the higher energy side like ultraviolet. They are very small and light, only weighing a few grams. They have got an advanced heart-like organ that pumps nutrients around their body, and the tough roots that make up their legs are mostly inside their body, almost like bones. They have a very light velvety fur covering their body, which is lovely and soft in domesticated variants of life today. Some live underground, but we're going to focus on the ones that live in trees because those are the ones that evolve flight. Nowadays, there are lots of flying plants in the humid forests of the Orient. The most famous is the tarpal, which turns from green to red when it's ready to mate, almost like a ripening apple. They have elaborate wings that evolve from the root legs, though those hardened parts are now completely inside the organism. The theory behind their evolution is similar to how we think bats evolved on Earth. They had a better chance of surviving a fall from a tree if they were lighter and had membranes to allow for gliding or even just a slower fall. Eventually that evolved to allow for big hands with membranes between them with powered flight. Their metabolism is the fastest of any known plant, and they flap their wings at speeds that can't be counted with the naked eye. Here's the final art. These sugary plants are a favorite snack for many people in the area. 
When they are roasted, they caramelize a bit and it's just delectable. While tarpals still eat insects at times, their trunk has evolved to get nectar from flowers as well. This probably evolved thanks to a gap in the nectar drinking niche, and the ground mouse plants have been doing their job of eating insects. Tarpals make high-pitched scream noises like a squeak that lasts too long, making them a minor pest when they're alive just because it's annoying. Because of this, they're not only easy to hunt, but are also overhunted, so they're pretty rare despite how quickly and plentifully they reproduce. It's like if mice were sugary and screamed and they flew around. Okay, not so much like a mouse. You get what I mean. For a long time, scientists didn't understand why they had so much excess sugar, but it seems that they keep stores of a honey-like substance in their roosts to feed their sprouts. When a tarpal dies, they're mixed into the honey by the others in their community. Now, let's look at the autotrophic lineage. These tend to be a bit weirder than the heterotrophs, and the group of autotrophs we're talking about today are characterized by being animal-like while it's a seed and then being more of what we're used to as an adult. It's an early divergence from the rest of the animal-like autotroph clade, and probably evolved as an elaborate way to get seeds away from their parents. 100 billion years ago, the seeds of the buoy tree paddled away when they dropped from their branch. Plants like them are still around today. Here's the final art. Buoy seeds usually have electroreceptors along the bottom of their bottom that help them to see potential threats underwater, and they have a little floaty device that keeps them upright, which gives them their name. They also have a large photoreceptor on the top of their head to detect light and movement. Head? It's a seed, so does it even have a head? I've decided yes. Lastly, they have paddles that they can move to swim across waters, though the waves often dictate where it goes. These kinds of plants are the reason the class of animal-like seeds were spread around origin. They are not as diverse as they once were, but are still common in the Orient. Some of the buoy's descendants came out of the water and hopped onto land after an extinction event that left some niches open 50 million years ago. When they were separated from their trees, their rubbery bodies bounced onto the ground and back up into the sky as they were carried to and fro by the wind. This was another evolution path for the sake of getting as far away from their parents as possible. Plants will do this to prevent inbreeding, so it's pretty important. They lost the electroreceptors, but the photoreceptor has become a simple eye that they can see the difference between land, sea, and sky. Even though they're spinning around as they bounce, they seem to have a pretty good sense of where they are and won't sprout till they're far enough away from their parent. While these bounce trees were common millions of years ago, only one species is left today. Here's the final art. Bounce seeds are very simple looking seeds that just look like a ball with a black dot on them somewhere. They feel like a rubber ball, though the black dot is sturdy and has less of a give to it. The dark green color allows them to photosynthesize efficiently, the energy of which they use to propel themselves into the air with their trapdoor foot. It's like a spring that lets them jump, which they try to use when it's as windy as possible in the direction they want to go. Lots of animals like to play with these seeds, which is probably uncomfy but ultimately good for the seed since it usually ends up in a different place and that's all the seed really wants. While the bound seeds are sealites, they are not the most derived of the flying seeds. They evolved in the same area as the tarpal, the humid oriental forest. A lineage of bound seeds started to open their foot in the air as it could sometimes allow them to glide just a tiny bit further. Slowly, this foot evolves into a full wing that could be used for gliding. Eventually, they lost the ability to close it back into their body in exchange for the ability to flap their wings. They still have the simple eye and evolved a beak to defend themselves from anything that tried to eat its nutritious wings. They seem to be playful, and even if they're far enough away from a parent, they really only go into the ground to sprout once their wings begin to wither. This only takes a week or two. Here's the final art. They've got little wattles that they use to hook themselves into the ground when they're ready to sprout. While these critters are small and light, bothering one could get you packed out of the forest. I forgot to write the size of the picture, but their wingspan doesn't grow longer than 10 centimeters, which is a little bigger than the diameter of a Big Mac. About a Big Mac and a half. They're not going to do any critical damage, but the sharp beaks are no joke. They're professionally referred to as pecking samaras, but in some areas they're fairy leaves or cap caps. There's three living species under two genuses. <laughs> genuses? There's three living species under two genuses, which tend to go by the regional names. Though if you're from Draconia, you'll call them all cap caps, and if you're from the mountains, you'll call them all fairy leaves. And yeah, you might be wondering if they evolved in the Orient, what are they doing in the Ochidan and the Glacian? Every once in a while, a Samara from one place will end up on the other side of the world. Sometimes they'll even survive and leave a non native tree. 
So even though pecking samaras most likely evolved in the Orient, they've made smaller populations around origin. Capcaps in the Ossetian have thicker beaks and are generally a bit bigger, while fairy leaves in the Glacian are less closely related and tend to be viewed as magical or mystical. They are really rare and have been for centuries. Scientists believe they are a remnant of an older lineage of flying seeds. Speaking of mystical, there's a cryptid in the mountain communities that's supposedly a draconic plant. It's the size of an airplane and is said to create the northern lights with power from its beak. Here's a final art. The Fairy King, also known as Bien To, is a mythical creature that's said to have psychedelic power. People have been found lying face up surrounded by a circle of withered fairy leaves, experiencing elaborate illusions and hallucinations of a better world. Once they wake up, they are inconsolably obsessed with a land that doesn't exist, a land they call Ethos. Folks in the area says it's the work of the Fairy King, but it's probably shrooms. That's about it for this video. Check out my Patreon, which you can subscribe to for just a dollar a month to support me and get your name at the end of my videos. Thanks Captain Kobop. I'm working on a huge Spec Evo video about the evolution of magic that kinda just turned into a general video stuffed with lore about origin in general. It's gonna be really good, I hope you stick around to see it. If that's not my next Spec Evo video, there'll be a regular scheduled one about giant arthropods. Yeah, that one's gonna be awesome too. Hope to see y'all there, but either way, thanks for watching.